Hi, I'm Rob. Uh, nice to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. This is a really cool uh, event. And uh, I actually live in Berkeley, even though I'm a student at Stanford. So it's nice to wander down the street to a cool conference. Um, so this is work from my dissertation, uh, but in conjunction with a ton of people in psychology, computer science, and linguistics at Stanford. I'm a fifth year linguistics PhD student at Stanford. Um, and I'm going to talk about the first study from my dissertation, which is, uh, the which is published, and there's a few that are not yet. Um, so our main question here is looking at police community interactions. Uh, do police officers treat white community members with a greater degree of respect than they afford to black community members? And this is something that people in many uh, jurisdictions report, um, but we're looking to sort of investigate it in an empirical way. Uh, when we talk about police community interaction, there's obviously a media focus on these explosive incidents uh, when particular violent uh, things happen. And there's a research focus on outcomes. But uh, one quarter of adults have contact with the police during the course of a year. The majority of these are during traffic stops. And there's an important concept uh, in the literature on policing about procedural justice, which is uh, even if it, we, we know that outcomes should be equitable. If you do the same thing, the outcome of the justice system should be the same. But procedural justice says that the whole process by which you interact with the justice system should also be equitable. And that can ultimately impact outcomes as well. So it's important. Respect in particular is important um, because research has demonstrated that a person who's treated with respect, especially in a policing context, is likely to have more trust in the individual officer's fairness, in the procedural fairness of the police as an institution, and from the police perspective, in one way that we're able to convince them to give us data for this kind of thing, is that uh, people, are, people who are treated with respect are generally more willing to support or cooperate with the police. But previous work on procedural justice and fairness in this area relies on things like citizens' recollection of past interactions. So you send out surveys to people who've been arrested or been stopped by the police and say, how did that go? Or you have researchers sort of physically present uh, at an interaction observing what the police are doing. So these are obviously invaluable, but they're indirect. And of course, the presence of a researcher might influence the way that the police behave. So in this work, we are using body camera footage as a source of data, uh, and in particular, body camera footage from Oakland, uh, California, so just down the road in the other direction. Uh, the Oakland PD has been wearing body cameras for about eight years at this point, but they are usually, in Oakland and everywhere, used only as evidence. So something bad happens, we go back and look at the tape and see what happened and kind of uh, get the facts on the ground for a court case or something like that. But of course, they're also a window into everyday behavior. Thousands and thousands of hours of body camera footage are being recorded around the country every day. Um, and so this is a way that we can understand the content of these interactions that people have with the police. Um, so that's our proposal, is to use this footage as data. And to do that, for this first study, we're looking at all traffic stops of black and white community members that happened in April 2014, so a particular month uh, in Oakland. And this amounts to 981 stops by 245 officers. Um, the drivers are majority black, which has to do with the demographics of Oakland as well as the demographics of who gets stopped. Um, and it's a total of 183 hours of footage. We turn that into a transcribed data set. Of course, this is a text conference. So this, uh, this is all working on text, which has been transcribed, uh, it, transcribed speech by professional transcribers. So they, as did all the researchers, underwent background checks by the OPD. They watched the videos, transcribed the words, uh, and then also as well diarized them, so said who's talking to whom. And we ended up with a data set of about 37,000 officer utterances, 350,000 words over these approximately 1,000 interactions. Uh, and so the interactions look something like this. Let's see, do I have a pointer? Is it this? Wait, ooh, I'm worried I just, oh, there we go, okay. Um, so yeah, just a sample uh, transcription where we know the times that things are happening, we know who's talking and when they're talking to the community member versus to dispatch or another officer. Uh, and the interactions look like this. Many of them are very mundane. Hi, hi, pulled you over. OK, I have the paperwork. I'm sorry. I have the, it's so on and so forth. Um, so we, this is broken down into three studies. The, the first one is, in a way, kind of a traditional social psych psychological study that we're going to use later to build a computational model. So, uh, study one is perceptions of officer treatment. 
In this study, what we're trying to do is understand, can human raiders judge respect from officer's language? Uh, and are there differences in officer respect towards black versus white community members uh, from just ju human judgments? So we have a task that looks like this. We give people a kind of decontextualized utterance so they don't know anything else about the interaction or the race of anybody or why they're stopped or anything like that. We just give them a sort of random sample of something an officer said with one line of context so that you know, if this person is saying F you or something, then they can have some context for the respectfulness of the response. Um, and we ask them a, a few dimensions, how impolite or polite was the officer, uh, as well as how respectful were they, polite, friendly, uh, formal, and impartial. Um, so those are the five dimensions that we asked. And it turns out that uh, when we look at the race of the, the person who was being spoken to, uh, there's already a difference on all of these dimensions, even with rating a uh, small number. This is about 400 human ratings of utterances. So we already see on each of these dimensions, there's a significant, statistically significant difference based on the race of the person that's being talked to, even though the participant didn't know that, per that person's race. Um, but these are all very correlated constructs. Um, and we kind of chose them because they're correlated and they're trying to get at this kind of underlying idea of respect, kind of like big R respect, that, uh, as opposed to the way we would colloquially talk about it. Um, so we use principal component analysis, which I can talk more in detail about if people are not familiar. But um, the idea is to just get at these kind of, it's a dimensionality reduction technique. We're going to just try to get at the latent space of respect. And it turns out that two components explain 93% of the variance. The first one we're going to call just respect, which is basically an element of each of these, of all of them, a little bit less loading on formality. but friendly, polite, respectful, and impartial. Uh, and that explains 71% of the variance in the ratings. And then another one, which we're going to call formality, or like cold formality, or maybe even social distance, explains 22%, which is very formal and unfriendly, uh, or less friendly. Um, and so when we look at just those two dimensions, we see that this race-based uh, difference is actually happening in this first dimension, in respect. And it's not happening in formality. So that's kind of interesting. You might think that, oh, maybe the explanation for why these ratings are higher is that they're being more formal to white people or something like that. But that doesn't appear to be the case. Um, so moving forward, um, we want to kind of scale this up to the entire data set. We have these 37,000 utterances, 1,000 interactions. This was only 414 utterances. We had a lot of raters on these, and they showed pretty high uh, reasonable agreement. Um, but what about the remaining utterances? And that's only one month. So what if we want to scale up even beyond this small set of data we're working with? So we are moving into the computational area. Uh, and particularly, we want to control for many contextual variables. So the results in the last slide hold even controlling for things like the race of the officer, um, the whether the person was arrested or got a citation. But the problem is that the, it's such a small uh, sample size that we can't necessarily be very confident in the value of those when we don't, for instance, have uh, a lot of utterances by the same officers or anything like, or a lot of utterances in the same location or for, for the same reason or whatever. So we want to control for a lot of contextual stuff. Which brings us to study two, which is the computational linguistics part, where we want to basically build a simple and interpretable machine learning model that can reproduce those human ratings. Um, so our goals here are to use some linguistic theories of respect and social distance to develop some linguistic uh, hand-built features that we can uh, detect automatically in transcripts. And then we're going to use the data from study one as supervised training data to learn some weights on these for to how respectful or uh, not certain features are. So linguistic theories of respect focus uh, on of politeness, which is kind of the way that linguists talk about this general area in, in general tend to focus on requests uh, and talk about requests as face-threatening acts and politeness as a way of mitigating that. So uh, one example of this is what they call positive politeness, which is where a request is interpreted as a threat to the hearer's self-image. Like, maybe I'm making a request of you because I don't like you or think you're not a good person. Uh, so I can be polite by emph emphasizing your value, emphasizing our good relationship, and so on and so forth. I'll show some examples of these features in a second. And uh, negative politeness is about more things like freedom of action. So uh, when I say, uh, you know, please pass the salt, the idea is that I'm 
putting a restriction on your freedom of action. Now you have to do the cumbersome task of passing the salt. And so by saying please, I'm acknowledging that I'm limiting your freedom of action and sort of uh, apologizing for that. I'm minimizing my request. I'm putting on record that I'm imposing on you as opposed to ignoring the impact on you. So uh, when we look at features for positive politeness, and these are drawn from linguistic literature, we had things like formal versus informal titles, where a formal title kind of acknowledges someone's societal role, things like sir and ma'am versus calling somebody bro or dude, uh, last names and first names, so you know, using Mr. Whoever versus uh, Johnny. Um, Introducing yourself is a feature of positive politeness, like our social interaction matters to me, so here's who I am. Uh, mentioning safety and mentioning this, the person's safety is another one that we include, which is really important in this context. And just using positive words is good and great and whatever. Uh, features of negative politeness include things like apologizing for the imposition of whatever I'm asking you, uh, thanking you for doing the thing I asked you to do, minimizing the imposition by saying things like, don't worry about it, it's okay, using various hedges to, uh, to also minimize the imposition, and potentially things like giving agency, like I'm gonna let you do X, allow you to do X, so on and so forth. So these are some examples of the features. We, um, oh yeah, and th the strong ones include things like negative impoliteness, so explicitly controlling action, like do X. Um, so for our methodology here, we're turning those features that I was talking about and, and a bunch more into uh, sort of hand-engineered mini heuristics to extract these from uh, the transcripts. So these include lexicons, regexes, dependency-based rules, and some, some more complex functions like bald commands is like the sentence starts with a, uh, with a verb in the present tense, you know, whatever. Um, and we're going to use these as features in a statistical model, which is just a linear regression because we want to understand very well, very cleanly why uh, certain features are um, predictive or not using log transformed counts. Uh, the intuition behind that being, you know, if I say please, that's much more respectful than not saying please at all, but saying please three times is not three times as respectful necessarily, kind of diminishing returns idea. Uh, and we use stepwise removal of the uninformative features and we get a reasonable R squared. That ex so basically our model is able to explain 26% of the variance in the human judgments. And it turns out that this is kind of on the order of a, a middle of the road annotator. So the model performs comparably to the way annotators perform compared to the rest of them. If you like extract an annotator and compare them to the other 10, uh, the model performs comparably. And what we find in terms of feature weights, so what we have here is on the left, the feature weights, the features that are perceived as more respectful to the right, uh, and these are the respectful ones here. Um, and we have, we have things like apologizing, saying I'm doing this for you, gratitude, reassurance, formal titles, last names, mentioning safety, uh, using positive words and hedges, so on and so forth. So these are, uh, many of them are very intuitive. On the right we have, what's the uh, odds ratio of this feature appearing in black stops versus white stops. So just kind of to get an intuition in the first place, you can see that these features that are coming out from our model, again, which has no information about race, are uh, in general happening more often in the stops of white community members across the board. And then if we look at the negative features, we have things like asking questions, linguistic negation like don't, no, et cetera, uh, negative sentiment words, asking for agent, so this is an interesting one actually, and it doesn't come out as significant in the model, but asking for agency is things like, uh, could you or will you? Um, and we, one sort of hypothesis about why this is coming out as less respectful, again, it's not significant, so I don't wanna to put too much weight on it, but uh, is that you know the officer is in a position of control, so perhaps these are is interpreted as somewhat disingenuous, like, could you please X, Y, Z? People are like, well, they, you know, the person has to do it, so why are they, uh, the asking for agency is a little disingenuous. But also, sorry, was there a question? No, cool. Um, so, and things like speech disfluencies, like the, that and what, what, um, and informal titles like bro and dude, which happen much more often in black stops, uh, stops of black community members, uh, using first names, and of course mentioning hands on the wheel. So here's a few examples. Um, these are ones that came out from the model as being a little less, uh, as lower in respect. So first name, can I see that driver's license again? It, it's showing suspended, is that, that's you. 
uh, or all right, my man, do me a favor, just keep your hands on the steering wheel real, real quick. So this is kind of an interesting one, which it, you could imagine per, for maybe the officer would justify this by saying like, oh, I'm trying to build rapport or something like that. But the model and humans interpret this as less uh, respectful in this context. So five minutes, cool, thanks. Um, and some more positive ones. Again, a lot of them are kind of intuitive. There you go, ma'am, drive safe, please. Uh, just says that uh, you fix fixed it, no problem. Thank you very much, sir, et cetera. So using this model in study three, we basically just want to scale up and look at differences uh, according to race across the entire data set. So the goals are to ask, uh, do the results of study one from human judgments hold robustly across an entire month of traffic stops, even when we control for a lot of contextual factors? The short answer is yes. So here's a big, big old plot of numbers. But um, this is the respect model and the race, uh, the main effect of race is still significant. Uh, we see that also um, if a search is conducted, the officer is less respectful, but if a citation issued, they're more respectful, which is kind of interesting. Also, they're more respectful when people are older. Um, they're also more formal when people are older and more formal towards women uh, is what we find. But interestingly, so the race of the officer is not, a, not an impact uh, in this, and I'll show another graph about that in a second. Um, one interpretation of this, obviously it's very abstract, is that white community members are 57% more likely to hear an officer say one of the top 10 most respectful thing, top 10% of the most respectful utterances that were used, and black community members are approximately the inverse for the least respectful ones. Um, and so all this holds even if we account for only everyday interactions, so removing all the arrests and searches, uh, the crime rate in the area, density of businesses in the area, whether the driver race was known before the stop, because they have to mark that on a, on a data form. Um, the officer years of experience. Actually, and I'll just mention a thing. So all the metadata about this is coming from forms that the officers themselves filled out at the time of the stop. So uh, I think there are many ways in which our results are very conservative. So we, uh, they are meant to turn on the body camera every time, but obviously we only have videos when they did choose to turn it on. Also, uh, the, ra the rating of race is what the officer thought the person's race was. Um, so conveniently, that's kind of what we want to be measuring. Um, it also holds, uh, even considering how severe the thing was that they were stopped for, so we had, we had officers rate the severity of stops based on the narratives that were written in the stop forms. And uh, from one to four, from very minor to very severe. And it turns out that actually, um, the black community members are stopped for less severe offenses in the first place, um, but this variable did not have an impact on respect. Um, so also if we look at officer race, so this is looking at every, every officer who had an inter at least one interaction with one white community member and one black community member and looking at the delta in those. So you can see it's, it's kind of a normal distribution, but it's similar no matter what the officer's race is where it's kind of shifted slightly to the right. So when people are interacting with black community members, they're likely to be a little bit more respectful. Um, there are some officers for whom the opposite, opposite trend holds, which is interesting, but uh, the general trend is to be more respectful to the white community members. Um, so race, officer race is surprisingly not a factor. Also because we have ratings now estimated for every utterance, we can look across the interaction and we find based on the time in the interaction, for, for instance, throughout the interactions that we're getting towards the end, the officers are being more respectful and in respect rises, but it rises faster for white community members. And it's kind of consistently higher throughout the interaction. And there's not really a difference in, uh, for, no, no race difference in formality, but officers are becoming less formal over the interaction. So as outcomes from this, confirms community reports, we see that interactions with black community members are more fraught. It provides some concrete strategies for officers. And in fact, we helped uh, write a training for Oakland's procedural justice uh, ongoing training, which they're currently doing. Um, so that's very exciting because we now have a model that can measure this and they're running this training and they're going to give us the data so we can test basically pre and post, like how, how does this training impact uh, respect in general and the racial disparities in respect 
Um, and so this is uh, Jennifer Aberhart, who's one of the PIs on the project in the psychology department. And basically the, the reason that we're able to have access to this data, because she does a ton of implicit bias training and works with the police departments has for decades. And she recorded a video talking about the results of our paper, which all the officers of the OPD watched. And this is uh, Officer Armstrong, who's one of the um, assistant chiefs, who basically is talking out with her and asking her all the questions the officers might have had so that they could kind of hear this back and forth about our finding. Um, we briefly, um, how much time do I have? Should I stop? No time left. All right, I'm done. Cool. <laughs> totally done. Questions? <laughs> Oh, sorry, do it, no time at all. Oh, it's okay, I guess we can take one or two questions. <laughs> I have a question about the first study, um, the human rating. Sure. Sorry if I missed this, if you said it already, but um, was there any disparity in terms of the race or, or gender demographics of the rater? So, no, um, but we were concerned about that because it was a classic psychology study where the, the raters were Stanford undergrads. Um, so, but they were, they were from diverse racial backgrounds relatively and we did include a control for that and it didn't appear to affect the results. However, uh, at, because of that concern, we ran a replication with people at the Oakland DMV. So we went to the DMV and while people are waiting in line, said, hey, do you have 10 minutes to, to do this survey? And we ran a replication. So that's really the population who uh, were trying to study. And um, in that case as well, there did not appear to be a difference in the way people would rate based on their race, even, even population in Oakland. So we, uh, we're going to publish a full replication that includes that, and we feel pretty confident that that's, that holds, yeah. Uh, can you go back to the, <coughs> the of the density of the officer's race? Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's like a little hump of density towards the yeah. tails I was wondering about. Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it seems like there's something there. Yeah, so you can see from the rug plot on the bottom here that that's only, that's only a few officers. Really, most of the density is concentrated here. Um, yeah, so I, maybe, maybe I used too high a smoothing or something. But, uh, <laughs> you know, in the, in, in the graph. But yeah, um, yeah, I think, so we don't, we, we are not really interested in making a model that is like, finding you know, the bad guys or something like that. I think that's a really, that's a tr very complicated and like troublesome thing. And the claim that we're making about our model is that it's good at measuring uh, things at a large scale and measuring the l large scale disparities, but individual officers, that also gets into like political difficulty with like the department being willing to allow that kind of thing to happen. So it's all a complicated thing, but anyway, I, I, I don't want to make any strong claims about that, I guess, is, is, is what I'm saying. But, it's, but it is potentially interesting, yeah. There is some research in outcomes that shows that there are bad egg effects for things like stop and frisk. Um, so, yeah, that's, it's something to consider in the future, I think. And there's another question, or am I out of time? That's something we're working on. So from a procedural justice point of view, uh, one kind of baseline response is that the officers like are in a position of power, they chose to start the interaction, they do it every day, uh, and the community member should receive equal treatment regardless of their behavior. Um, so that's kind of one sort of ethical or, or kind of moral stance to take, I think. Um, but it's a really, the interactional question is a really complicated one, and I'll just use the opportunity to show this, which is that one thing that we kind of preliminarily find is that if officers are more respectful in the first half of the interaction, community members are less likely to use angry words in the second half. So, but we're starting to basically, the third chapter of my dissertation is trying to untangle some of this because it's a very complicated back and forth interactional thing. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks everybody.